Grace and peace to you in the name of the risen Christ. Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Cathedral of Hope. Well, in this very room, there's enough love for the whole world, so we're glad that you're here. I'm Todd Scoggins, and this is the Reverend Shelley Hamilton. Hallelujah. (laughs) Y'all glad to be here today? I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here today. We're glad to be here. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're here today. Way to show up. Yes. Um, if this is your first time at the Cathedral of Hope, we especially want to extend you a special welcome. If you would, meet me in the visitor center following this service. We have a gift for you just to say thanks for being here. We want to answer any questions you may have about the cathedral, and so please join us at that time if you could. We'd also like to tell you about some new classes coming up. Um, you can read all of the details on uh, page 13 in your bulletin, uh, but just to bring your attention to a couple of them, Uh, Pay pay particular attention to the devotional studies that are beginning around immigration. Uh, They start tomorrow evening, uh, July 14th. Uh, And this is a 
an excellent opportunity for us to gather together in these studies and begin to pray for discernment and clarity about what our role will be uh, in the current immigration uh, difficulties that are facing uh, our state and the nation. So very important. Uh, also a Spanish class, also very important, uh, begins this Thursday night. Si. Yeah. Buenos dias. Como esta? Ah. Yeah. That's Good. as far as you Good. can go, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to take the class. We're going to take Join the class. Join us. He's got to work on his accent, and I got a lot to work on. Yeah, I don't think it's like, como se llama. It's como, como diama. Como diama. Yeah. Como diama. Okay. What else you got? Aren't you going to teach a class, you and Debbie yes, Sue? Yes, Debbie Sue Yelverton and I are going to be teaching a class on uh, healing prayer. We'll be doing a book study uh, on a book called Stretch Out Your Hand. Uh, that'll be starting uh, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. All of the classes begin at 7 uh, on Tuesday. Uh, also, I'll bring to your attention that on the second and fourth Sundays of every month, um, in the East Wing, there'll be a, a prayer group that meets between the services, and the specific role of this prayer group will be to pray for our pastoral search committee and our process as a whole. So Absolutely. a good thing to gather together with sisters and brothers in prayer about. That's great. A group met today between services. They'll be meeting again on Anniversary Sunday between the services, so please join them if you like. There's also a new, another class that starts today, and it is our Covenant Keepers class. This is the class that we invite people to come to that want to learn more about the church, who we are, our history, where we're going. But particularly, if you want to join the church, we do ask that you attend both session one and session two. Now, to attend the classes, you aren't required to join, um, but we would like you to come and, and participate. And to offset some of the difficulties with scheduling, uh, we're offering it on Sunday and Tuesday. So we'll offer a class this afternoon for session one, again on Tuesday for session one, and again the same schedule next week. I believe that's on page 10 of your uh, COH News. But please join us today. You don't need to register, sign up, just come, be with us. We'd love to have you be a part of that class. And one other thing I forgot to mention in the first service is uh, we are offering the walk, which has also been known as the journey. It's a part of the walk to Emmaus, Crisio, Chrysalis. These are three-day spiritual renewal retreats, and we're going to have our first walk in October, and the leadership team is joining together. And um, if you're interested in going on the walk, it is October 2nd through the 5th. You can come to the Ministry and Visitor Center. Uh, one of our leadership team members will be there to give you applications, answer questions, and things like that, but it's a great opportunity to do things like that. It's a wonderful spiritual opportunity. I understand that it really helps uh, deepen people's walk with God and their understanding of ministry, uh, and also transforms them uh, spiritually. So think about that, pray about Absolutely. that. Thanks. I'd also like to bring to your attention um, a special congregational meeting that's been called for July 26 at 1 p.m. Um, that's here in the sanctuary. There'll be uh, one agenda item, we promise, uh, and it'll be simply to review and vote on the new bylaw changes uh, that the bylaws committee uh, has been working so hard this past year on revising. So it's a um, this special election is kind of, you know, it's a moving, uh, continuing to move more deeply into uh, our process in terms of learning about how to become a congregationally governed church. So it's very important that you participate and be a part of that. Now, Paul was with us in the first service, but I want to say thanks to him in front of this congregation as well. Uh, Paul Pedersen and our bylaws team have been working really hard uh, this past year, and so we just want to give thanks to them, appreciate their service. They do this as volunteers uh, to help make us a better church, so we appreciate all that they're doing. <laughs> Last but definitely not, not least, in two weeks we are celebrating the 44th anniversary of the Cathedral of Hope. How many of you have heard of the show Hell's Kitchen? Anyone? Any cooks out there today? <laughs> Who's daring to say they will cook? We're turning it into Hope's Kitchen, and we are having a cook-off. So the space we're going to is in Trinity Grove, just on the other side of the new bridge, and it's the Culinary Event Center. It has eight kitchens, and so we're going to have a full blowout potluck dinner. We're going to have live music. Kids can come. It's for everybody. And a cook-off. Cook in these eight kitchens, one's going to be for the youth, the rest are for adults. And we want to invite those who would like to lead a team 
six to seven friends to join you. You can sign up in the ministry center after church today. And then on Wednesday the 23rd, at the end of the Pulse worship service on Wednesday night, we're going to draw the names of the eight people who are going to pick teams. And when those eight teams get to the event center, this cracks me up. Me too. They're going to get a bag of groceries, all the same, and they have one hour to create and cook something for us to eat. Now, not for all of you, so don't get nervous. Don't say, oh, I'm going to get my, you know, Pepto-Bismol ready or anything like that. But Shelly and I... I'm going to bring a little extra sack with me. (laughs) Shelly and I, if her name is not drawn out, because she's quite a cook, but if her name is not chosen, we'll be a couple of the judges, and there'll be several others that will go along, and we will give awards out uh, based on all kinds of categories. So it's going to be a blast. You don't want to miss it. No ticket required. Did you know that the gift given on a 44th anniversary is groceries? No kidding. No kidding. Google it. 44th gift, groceries. So you don't have to have a ticket, but we're going to ask everyone to bring some sort of canned goods to fill our pantry up. We have a lot of hungry people that we feed every week, and we need your help to do so. So our 44th anniversary grocery gifts are going to bless this community. Amen. In the hope and joy that we have together, let's rise as we are able and greet each other in God's name. and our minds, O oh God, and open us, open us fully to the movement of your spirit this morning. We pray in your many names. Amen. You may be seated. Our modern lesson is where the edge gathers, building a community of radical inclusion by Bishop Yvette A. Flander. Hear these words. Recently, there has been a growing movement to challenge the theology that allows churches to be private social clubs and calls on them to become more involved in the life of the community. This enables the celebration of diversity and inclusion of all peoples, especially those who have traditionally been marginalized by religious institutions. Yet, there is often a heavy price to pay for individual pastors and their congregations who make this courageous change. 
congregations become bitterly divided, membership decreases, financial stability is lost, leaders are removed from their positions of authority, and social ostracization is unleashed on the pastors and their congregations alike. True community, true church, comes with marginalized people take back the right to be fully be. A people must be encouraged to celebrate not in spite of who they are, but because of who their creator made them. The bomb that heals oppression sickness is the creation of accountable, responsible, visible, celebrating communities on the margin of mainline church and dominant society. May God bless the hearing of these new words. Amen. Let's join hands for prayer. And if you prefer not to join hands, that's okay. Pray like this or however you want. God, thank you so much for bringing us together this morning to this beautiful place. 
with your beautiful people. We feel your presence tangibly in our bodies, in our spirits. Be as real to us, God, all week long as the hands we hold, as real as the people close to us. Be that close to us, God, closer, like breath. We come to you, God, praying for our world today, for peace in places where there is strife or warfare, particularly where religion is at the root. We pray for the peace of Palestine and Israel. Help us to be peacemakers, God, in every situation. We pray for children everywhere, and we especially pray for the children of Central America who are finding their way to our borders at this time. For these refugee children, God, we pray for open hearts, open minds. Help us to shape an experience for them that is different from the world they're leaving. And help us to build a new world where they're all children, all children are cared for, fed, educated, protected, important. We pray for those among us who are sick or in need of healing of mind, body, or spirit. We name before you now the names of people that we're thinking about that are in need of healing. In the name of Jesus Christ, the great physician, the great healer, we pray, God, for the comfort of all the people that we're praying for. Take away their pain or fear. Bring perfect peace in this moment and your healing. We pray for those who have died, those who find their rest with you now, God, particularly those who have died recently or even a long time ago, but they're on our hearts and minds today. We name before you the names of people that, uh, that we're missing. Bradley. Remind us each day, God, of the power of resurrection and console us with the sure and certain hope that we will be together again someday. We pray for our church, for its boards and committees, for our finances, for the social service projects in which we engage, for all the people who make the worship services happen and all the volunteers who participate in the daily life of our cathedral, for the musicians, everyone connected in any way with making this place a sanctuary, a safe place. Bless them, God. Bless our finances. Help us to have the resources we need to do what you have called us to do. Prosper us, God. We have prayers of gratitude and thanksgiving. I invite you now to share them aloud, to say out loud what you're grateful for. Keep us ever grateful, God, for your presence and activity in our lives. All our hopes and dreams, God, we offer to you in your many names, using this prayer this morning that Jesus taught us, using whatever form or language that we want. We pray, our Mother and Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy names, thy presence come, thy thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, glory forever. forever and ever. Peace to God. 
Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Come, Holy Spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O God. Jesus continued, saying, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the gospel of hope. Praise, Praise to you, Creator, Christ, Christ and, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. I want to introduce our guest speaker in a moment, but I want to introduce two people who are with her who are uh, important, distinguished guests as well. Uh, the uh, Bishop Flunder's spouse of 30 years, and she will pay honor to her uh, also in her sermon, uh, is Shirley Miller, Mother Miller, as she's called in the City of Refuge Church. And She is a distinguished vocalist, recording artist, minister in her own right. She has quite a ministry and has mentored many people and has touched many people. You are truly a mother to the nation, and I so appreciate knowing you, and I'm so glad that you're here. And I know Vivette's going to honor you too, but I, it's always important for me to say, on her own, she is a saint of the church. Also as our guest uh, this morning is Pastor Marvin Roberts from Living Faith Covenant Church. Living Faith Covenant Church is in Oak Cliff, and it's a largely African-American, largely Pentecostal, largely same gender loving, always hard to categorize a church, as we know, and yet those are distinctive aspects of Living Faith Covenant Church. And Pastor Roberts uh, pastors with his, with his spouse, Bishop Alex Bird. But I wanna say this to you, as I said in the earlier service, we want a closer relationship between Living Faith Covenant Church and Cathedral of Hope. We want to make that strong statement. And you are our esteemed guest. So now I want to introduce our guest preacher. And I'm going to ask her to come forward. I think this is my happiest day at Cathedral of Hope because I'm uh, introducing you to someone who is so dear to me. I, I, words fail me, really. Uh, my sister, and I mean that in every aspect of the word, uh, and someone that I've worked with in ministry for many years, nearly 30 years. We don't look old enough to have known each other that long, but, you know, <laughs> clean living. It's that Pentecostal living, that holiness lifestyle, I know. And I've known her in her years as uh, initially, she began her ministry as a, also a recording artist uh, at the Love Center in Oakland, which is the, the mother church of gospel music, I, I think it's fair to say, at least in the western part of the country, yes. Uh, but Yvette went on to start City of Refuge Church, which would be a church where all same gender loving people could be themselves, a self-determined church and a spiritual home. Pentecostal, uh, largely African American, I have always felt there more at home than I even felt in the church I grew up in. And if you ever go to Oakland, you must worship there. 
Uh, you will not uh, regret it. It's a United Church of Christ congregation, and Yvette's ministry was so, such a model that she began a, a denomination or a fellowship called Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, largely gay, largely black, largely Pentecostal churches, many of which also belong to the United Church of Christ. So I'm just saying you could belong to the United Church of Christ and also belong to fellowship, even if you were not necessarily as integrated yet as you want to be and as spirit-filled as you might want to be. You still could be like Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ, slash Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. Just, just saying, for no particular reason, because sometimes you never know, right? Yvette is a civic leader in San Francisco and nationally. Uh, whenever there are uh, occasions when the White House wants to tap into particular communities, she's on speed dial. And it's true, she's had an influence in policy and all those levels. Here's what I know to be true and why I trust her so much. She's a person of complete integrity. Who you see is who she is and who you'll experience shortly is who she is. I've always been able to tell her whatever I need to, the truth, the truths, the painful truths, and know that I will be met with unconditional love and also stern reproof if I need it. Uh, she does both of those things. And you can trust her. This is how I know. She said, Jim, let's go to Zimbabwe. And I said, not, ah, Zimbabwe, are you sure? Uh, have you read the newspaper lately? Uh, but uh, she said, yes, Zimbabwe. And she took me and others there to the most beautiful place on earth, the mother of peace, HIV AIDS orphanage in Matuko. Who knew that there was this lovely refuge there uh, in a very painful situation? And Yvette's, this is part of Yvette's vision. This is how she touches the world. It's not just local, it's not just national, it's global, and it's personal and transformational too. So I love Yvette, and I hope that you will too. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good to be here. I have always the disclaimer to make that I am a Pentecostal again. And uh, as I say often, I have no concept of time. And so I've been told by my sister and brethren that the 11 o'clock service allows the preacher a little more preaching time. That probably wasn't a good thing to tell me. <laughs> so I'll still be mindful that you haven't had lunch. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be here. It's good to be home. Texas is home for my family. I'm the first generation born out of Texas in California, and I'm uh, born and raised in San Francisco, and I have a Texas accent. How about that? And I, I love ham hocks and butter beans. <laughs> Greens and hot water cornbread. Amen. Fried chicken. There will be chicken in heaven. <laughs> because it is called paradise. Let me say also that I am so grateful to have my partner and spouse. You know, we got married when Marion was available the first time in California. But we don't celebrate that anniversary. The one we celebrate is the one that God gave us as our union together 30 years ago. And I'm so grateful that she is here and well and healthy. We are blessed to have two daughters, a niece of Shirley's that I raised and we raised together, and my birth daughter, and we have two grandsons who are perfect in every way. <laughs> and even when they're wrong. <laughs> I'm so grateful for City of Refuge. I'm so grateful for Living Faith Covenant Church here in Dallas, Texas. And Pastor Marvin, Bishop Alex, we just came off of three or four days of conferencing for the southern region over which Bishop Alex Bird presides. And we've had a great, great time. And it is so good to be here at Cathedral of Hope and to have known you in many of your iterations and to see you going into your bright tomorrow, to watch you getting ready for your what's next is exciting to me. And I want you to know I am organically connected to you. 
I am your sister, and there's really nothing at all you can do about it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so it is good to be here. Good to be with you. Done some dangerous work with Jim Matulski in San Francisco, in Atlanta, various parts of the world, in Zimbabwe, all over Africa where we work. And our fellowship has grown now to include 14 churches in Asia. And I'm just so grateful to see God moving in such a powerful way. I ask you, or say this to you, to ask you to keep us in your prayers and thoughts as we continue to expand the reach where folks are getting a polluted understanding of the scandalous gospel of Jesus Christ the scandalous gospel that would dare really say that all can come to the table. And I encourage your prayers for us. I'm moved today by a conversation that we are having in many places by what is happening with young people from South America and from Mexico, and what is happening with young people who are caught between the crossfire from the Jewish folks and the Palestinian folks, and I cannot imagine young people being killed and buried. I cannot imagine young people being set on fire simply because the elder people are struggling with what I have come to call the either-or God. I believe that it is a skewed God view that gives people permission at times to do the evil things that we do to one another. It's amazing what we can do when we think that God is on our side. It's an incredibly sad thing to see our young people caught in that place, and it moves me to share with you a little bit about what I believe to be the either-or God bowing to what I have come to call the both-and God. In Genesis, the 16th chapter, and the 7th through the 10th verse, I'll read just a little bit of the account in Genesis 16 and 21 of the slave woman, Hagar, who was the slave to Abraham and Sarah, and also the mother of Abraham's firstborn, Ishmael. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, this after she had left Abraham and Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said, Hagar, maid of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And then the angel of the Lord said, and I will so greatly multiply your descendants that they cannot be numbered for multitude. She went back, and then God spoke again, and she left again. And God spoke to her on her second sojourn and said, I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman because he is your offspring. And Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, put it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. She departed to the land of Beersheba. Then a little further down, when the water was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes, and she went and sat down over against him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look upon the death of my child. And as she sat over against him, the child lifted up his voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him fast in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. This promise to Hagar, the slave woman, and her child. In my most recent reading of scripture, I seem to be drawn to examples of what I have come to call the both and as versus the either or God. 
Perhaps it is because I have grown weary of the constant and senseless violence touted as righteousness and perpetuated in the name of God. In Uganda, in Cameroon, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, there are draconian laws that demonize, vilify, and objectify LGBT people and encourage corrective rape, prosecute family and friends, and put people in jail for up to 15 years, not just for being gay, but for knowing that someone is gay and not turning them in. And much of that negative influence comes from the hatred spewing what I've come to call Christian jihadists here in the United States who, by the way, are now saying because of his support for us in so many ways that President Obama is gay. I heard that just the other day. I didn't know that. I know him well. <laughs> he didn't tell me that. I don't know. <laughs> but thank God that Congresswoman Barbara Lee and the Congressional Black Caucus have spoken out loud about the injustice perpetrated against people of African descent on the continent of Africa because they are gay or are friendly, are allies, are supporters, or family members of LGBT people. One of the sad truths that I don't like to admit, particularly in an audience where most of my brothers and sisters are of European descent, one of the great sorrows that I have is that the African-American church and our principal leaders are conspicuously quiet about this injustice on the continent of Africa. And it troubles me in places where I can't even openly describe to you. I will say to you this, that it suggests that we have been colonized ourselves by a certain hatred of ourselves. Either you do what I say, the either or people say. Either you do what I say, you believe what I believe, you support what I support, or you become my enemy. And anyone who is my enemy is God's enemy. That's an incredibly sad reality, but that's the way that it has been taught to us. And we have learned it so internally, it's almost written on our DNA. It's troubling to me that this both and God that we celebrated already in this service today is not widely accepted and appreciated in religious circles. Seems that the foundation of much of what we hear today from religious influence circles is encouraging polarization and separatism. Oh, you hear it. We're on our way into another election cycle, and here we go. Listen to it, it's everywhere. Here we go. Here we go. I turn on Fox News for entertainment. Here we go. Here we go. It's almost predictable. You know what's going to be said as soon as something happens. It comes down to now you have to choose your side. Agree with your folks, even when you disagree deep in your soul. It's as though you cannot have an opinion of your own. If your group is saying it, then you have to say it. If you're red stated, you have to say red stated stuff. If you're blue stated, you have to say blue stated stuff. Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you a creationist? They say intelligent designers now. Are you an evolutionist? Are you a Protestant? Are you a Catholic? Are you a oneness Pentecostal or a Trinitarian Pentecostal? Are you straight or are you gay? Because you know, by we don't, we don't support that. So are you straight <laughs> or are you gay? <laughs> Do you side with the Jews? Are you with the Palestinians? Are you for abortion? Are you for choice? And what about Obamacare? How you feel about that? And how you come down on it determines which club you're in. And God forbid that you are a person who chooses to pick a little bit of this and that and have your own opinion 
and not have your opinion determined by a group of people. The question comes up again and again, are you with us? Are you against us? Make up your mind. Conservatives line up over here. Liberals line up over here. You have to go with the whole kahuna, the whole full Monty, if you're going to be in our club. You can't be duly affiliated. Pick a side and don't be found over in the enemy's camp. See, the both and God does not play well in a fundamentalist atmosphere. Whether that fundamentalist atmosphere is liberal or conservative, you know, there's such thing as a liberal fundamentalist. Well, all right. It doesn't play well. It doesn't play well. And it is a message often not lifted up from Scripture. We don't read that, but it is there. It is essential, however, because so much of the present and historical hostility in the world is rooted in our God view. I am watching candidates now get in the God view gamut, the God gamut. People are asking, well, what kind of church did they come from? What is their belief system like? I was amazed that a Mormon ever got close to the White House. And I remember that there was an interview down in Florida when there was, and of course they picked a man that had no teeth in the front, no teeth in the top, <laughs> no teeth in the bottom. And they said, well, tell us, what do you think about Obama. He said, well, <laughs> Obama is a Muslim. He know he a Muslim. Why don't he just admit it? <laughs> and the question, and it begs the question, and so what if he is a Muslim? What in the world difference does it make? <laughs> Let me say it again. What if he is a Muslim? What in the world difference does it make? And it brings up for me this continued question of how can a Christian be an anti-Semitic? How do we pull that off? Jesus was a Jew. A Jew. Born a Jew, circumcised on the eighth day a Jew, raised a Jew, went to the temple, prayed a Jew, stood up in the temple, read from the scroll of Isaiah, as a Jew, died a Jew, never was a Christian. <laughs> but our God view separates us and defines who has the real, full, intact truth of God. I'm a Christian. Well, how were you baptized? Did they sprinkle? Did they dunk? Did they pour? Were you a baby? Had you had confirmation? Did you name the name of Jesus Christ? Did you speak in tongues? I have to test all of that to see if I can believe in the validity of your baptism. This is what we do to each other. We Methabaptic, Costa Catholic, Angler, Episcopalians. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. Religion. Religious fundamentalism suggests that God has been fully revealed to somebody. And the, everybody <laughs> believes they have a full revelation of God. Every faith teaches this is the full, intact revelation of God. And that is why religion is so violent. Because we who know believe that because we know whoever believes differently by default is fundamentally flawed. And it's not a far cry from my believing that you don't have the real truth to being able to shoot you for it. It's not a far cry. People are killing people because they believe they are doing God a favor. Who is this God? Who is this both and God? Religious fundamentalism suggests that God has been fully revealed and we know who God is, all of what God wants, how God moves, and other people don't know what we know. We can make that mistake as liberals. And often, 
disconnect ourselves from people who are in another way of thinking. It's important to understand this is why good Christian folks in this part of the world, in this state some years ago, when it was very different between your mothers and fathers, some of you, and my mothers and fathers, when I couldn't stand in a place like this, and when good Christian folks could get together and they could sing a hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, go outside, have a picnic, and lynch someone for entertainment. It's incredible, in the name of God and for the cause of God, that the Ku Klux Klan could have been a religious organization whose moniker, whose symbol was the cross of Jesus Christ. That's incredible to me that such a thing is possible, but it is possible when good Christian folk somehow ascribe to the teaching of an either or other than. You see, when you don't hold on to a both and God, you can get in a camp. And when you get in that camp, you can decide whoever's not in the camp is not of God. Good Christian folk. This explains why a young man could be forced to give his name and summarily be beheaded by his executioners while they cry, Allah, Akbar. God is great. God is great. God is great. Or a young woman can be buried in the dirt up to her neck and stoned to death simply because she falls in love with a young man from another Muslim sect. Both of them are Muslim, but they're different kinds of Muslims, and her family, her family and her community took her life. And that right now, we have young people being killed, some by young people, both of which suggesting that they know God, God by another name, but still God, killing in the name of God. How sad is that? And where did they get that example from? Where did they learn that behavior, brothers and sisters? Where do, what kind of teaching are we giving to the world to suggest that any of us has that kind of corner on God? Presidential candidates gearing up running the God gambit, using these children as a political plank who are incarcerated now in the United States because they are coming here, some of them, to try to find work so that they can take care of families in Mexico and South America. It is an incredible reality for us in this time. I know about the either or God. I know about binary constructs like right and wrong, black and white, and heaven and hell, and in and out. That's the way I was raised. I told you I was raised as a fundamentalist Pentecostal where we start to find one answer to all things theological. And we had some tough stuff to try to figure out, like where did the dinosaurs come from? Somebody, and if one while we thought that the devil put the bones in the ground. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> just to confuse the church, you understand what I mean. It was complicated. You know, when Cain left Adam and Eve and went and got married, who was that he married? Who was that? It was his sisters, like, God forbid. That's, so how did that happen? We had lots of questions that we needed to answer. And so we had to try to find one answer to all the difficult questions. And if we didn't know the answer, we listened at night on the radio to the Bible Answer Man. And he had told us what were the answers to the difficult questions. And I listened carefully to him because by the time I was about 22, 23 years old, Jim, I knew everything. <laughs> everything. Every single thing. And I was so glad to be able to tell you when you asked me questions what the answers were. And I said it with authority because, of course, I knew everything. <laughs> and the older I get, and the older I get, the less I seem to know. It seems I don't have the clear, definitive answers that I once had. In fact, I find that I have more questions than I have answers. But I'm happier than I've ever been. 
because I realize that there are many more questions and many more answers to come and that I am not required. I tell you, the thing I like to say the most these days is I don't know. I say, well, what, what do you think about it? I don't know. <laughs> well, are you a premillennialist or a postmillennialist? Sal, I don't know. <laughs> are we going to have the, the grand table supper of the lamb? This is eschatological talk. Are, are, are we going to, is, is Jesus coming soon and going to blow the whole thing to hell? Child, I don't know. I don't know. He might have come already. I don't know. All I can tell you is that I know I belong to God and that God belongs to me. Hallelujah. And that's reason enough for me to rejoice in ways that I don't even have words to describe. Let me go a little further and say that once I found the right way and I realized that my right way was right for me. I allowed others to go the way that was right for them. Hallelujah. I thought once before that God only honored my creed and my canon and my saints and my miracles and my dogma and my signs and wonders, my church culture, my worship style, my mode of expression. I really believed that God really clapped on the two and the four and dance, the Pentecostal dance, and spoke in tongues. And that God personified as God, the mother, would, would have a big church hat on. Anybody understand what I'm saying? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And I believe that any deviation from what I believe suggested that a person was substandard. But I'm amazed as I grow and evolve theologically that I'm as uncertain as I am. I can feel in myself, inside of myself, the ability to accept and receive all my stuff. And I'll say it again. If I were in a Pentecostal church, I would encourage you to say to your neighbor, I want all my stuff. So just for a minute, tell your neighbor, I want all my stuff. Now, I've got some stuff, and there's some stuff that I would have missed if I didn't go after all my stuff. I'm a Cherokee. And I'm Irish, and I'm from West Africa. I know that much about myself. And all of those things going on inside me at the same time, and much of that has been colonized out of me, demonized and vilified. But I'll say it again, I'm a Cherokee, and I'm from West Africa, and I'm Irish. How about that? <laughs> Run tell somebody I said it. I'm Irish and Cherokee, and, and, and the truth is, all of those cultures like the drum. That explains a lot. <laughs> and when I hear it, and I, and I can get, when I go to Africa and I watch the folks move, I say, that's where I got that from. <laughs> so that's working for me. And I, I watch Cherokee people dance, and, and, I can, and they do that thing that when they dip in like this. I say, see, I understand that. <laughs> because I come from that. It's kind of like the wobble, you know? Anybody understand what I mean? That works for me. And my faith path is influenced by it. My faith path is influenced by all of those traditions coming together, but I was taught to demonize and vilify my African self. I was taught to demonize and vilify. You see, we'll never be whole people until we get all our stuff first. Then we can let other people have their stuff. And then we can put our stuff together. And imagine what kind of stuff we'll have when all of our stuff gets together at one time. <laughs> let me move this along. I'm enjoying this adventure. I'm having a ball. I'm enjoying being able to touch my Yoruba roots. I'm enjoying being able to understand that God was doing something before 2,000 years ago. I'm enjoying being able to, in, to experience my, and, and, and to be able to believe that that reality exists because there is a common Christ. Oh, I'm having a Pentecostal moment. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is a common Christ, the anointed one that covers all things that are of the divine. 
And that common Christ is the same Cherokee Christ and the same Jewish Christ and the same Yoruba Christ and the same Lugumi Christ and the same Santeria Christ and the same Catholic Christ and the same Lutheran Christ and the same Methodist Christ and the same Christ that loves the earth, the same pagan Christ. How incredible is that reality that God could actually be that big and that broad and that great and that open. How incredible is that? What a blessing that is. What a blessing to know that, to sense that and to let that course through us. And we won't be stuck in any particular anything because it's bigger. And I said the other day, there are 40,000 planets, they say, in our solar system that have water, which means they can have life. So we could have some sisters and brothers with six arms and 12 eyes somewhere. <laughs> Hallelujah. And who knew but that God perhaps incarnated God's self and visited them. And maybe one day when we get where we're going, we'll be awesomely surprised at how big our God really is and how great our God really is. Let me move on. I got stuck. I'm sorry. Either or folks who believe in an either or God seem to have more clarity about what they believe because they distill it down into a little something. Oh, you hear me? And they all speak the same thing. You ever go on the television and listen during a political campaign and everybody says the same thing. They say the same thing because they get together and talk about what they hate and they say the same thing. Both and folks have a bit of difficulty doing that because there are so many different ways, so many different expressions, but we need to find our common denominator too. And if our common denominator is nothing more, hallelujah, than that we love each other. We have lived to learn that you can love the hell out of anybody. <laughs> and if, if we can come together on that, that in and of itself will change the world and change the message that God has for the world. And let me end with this. Many examples of the both and heart of God in the scripture is evidenced in the life of Jesus and the apostles. Jesus spoke on more than one occasion about other sheep that I have. Mary sat down in the living room reclining on pillows with the men while Jesus taught at her home in Bethany and Martha hollered from the kitchen, girl, have you lost your mind? <laughs> Come back in the kitchen, that is not your place. Jesus said, leave her alone. She's chosen the better part. And Paul told the Galatians that in Christ we are neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. God is not stuck with having to bless one communion and curse another, bless one baptism and curse another. So I lifted up this example in the Hebrew Bible for your consideration. Hagar, the Egyptian slave girl who ran away, chapter 17, and was run away in chapter 21. Because as the mother of Abraham's first child, she and her son were a great aggravation to Sarah. Abraham and Sarah were promised Isaac, but what of Ishmael? And I need for that to resonate in your spirit today. What of Ishmael? Some people suggest he was a contingency plan, something that went wrong and therefore he was expendable. Can God bless the offspring of Hagar and the offspring of Sarah at the same time? Can God bless your family and my family at the same time? Can God bless straight and gay folks at the same time? Can God bless Americans and folks who aren't American and are angry with America at the same time? Can God bless you and your adversary at the same time? Will God bless people even if we don't want God to? And when God does, do we get the Jonah depression? When he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he was afraid God was going to bless his enemy. Well, what are we going to do 
if God blesses who we don't like. Because God's blessing us, and some folk don't like us. Hello. What are we going to do? Is it really possible that our God is the God of Christians in all of our many manifestations, and Jews, and Muslims, and the many others who are not in the big three, anybody hear me? Whose minds and hearts seek the divine, hallelujah. There's no telling what God may do next. Hold on to your hair weave. <laughs> no telling what God may do next. Remember this, my beloved. There were two trees in the garden, one for the knowledge of good and evil according to the creation story in the Hebrew Bible. The other was a tree of life. Religion is stuck at the wrong tree. The question should not be what is good and what is evil because the answer is relative to where you are theologically in your growth and who you are in the equation and whether it's going to work for you. Is killing wrong? Some people say, yes, it's wrong, and will heartily support an unjust war and capital punishment at the same time, right? There are some who say that we believe in this, but then secretly they believe something else. Folks who tend the tree of right and wrong are the ones with power. But let me say something to you. They tended the wrong tree. There's another tree in the garden. And it is the tree of life. And the real question about where we ought to be is, does this thing bring life? You see, that's the only good that religion has in the earth. If it's not healing anybody, what is it for? When they got ready to consecrate me a bishop, and all of my colleagues and all of the pastors that we serve with, they got together and said, we're going to do your consecration. We're going to do your consecration. And they gave me, you haven't seen me in my drag. I got some drag for this. I got some full-on drag. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I got the hat and I got the, I got all kind of stuff. Just, I'm telling you, you know, to see me, I'm short, but I got a lot of stuff, a lot of my stuff on. And I said, so you're going to consecrate me. I have one question. If after I become a bishop, will I be better able to get people off crack? And somebody said to me, well, what has that got to do with it? So then I want to know, what has the consecration got to do? with my ability to help people move from where they are to deliver them from stigma and to return them to productivity. Because if that kind of change does not exist, then you can keep all the robes, do you hear me? And you can keep all the hats and the rings. You can keep all the bells and smells. If we are not able to really help people shift and change, then we are in the business of religion. We are not doing the work of the common Christ. And I'm almost through. Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! Let me end with this. You may call me, me naive, say, well, you really don't get it, you don't understand. But for me, a glimpse of the reign of God is one where we can appreciate all baptisms, the pours, the dunkers, and the sprinklers, all communions and Eucharist and extended families, adopted, straight and gay, holy writ, whether it's whether it's Quran or it's the scripture as we understand it, whether it's the one that we've canonized or the one that's apocryphal or the one that's pseudepigraphal, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's enough truth in all of them to help us stop killing each other. All prayers, spontaneous and liturgical, all people seeing each other knit together like a quilt into one family of God. All of us on a journey together listening to the still speaking God. To me, that's religious evolution, and I'm an evolutionary, where we don't have to be the same thing to mind the same things, where any war in the family is a civil war, and where all the children are safe. Can I leave this with you? There is a notion of paradise that says that the lion lays down with the lamb. For the lion and lamb, but by the way, this is not natural. It ain't natural <laughs> for a lion and lamb because one of them eats the other. <laughs> Anybody hear me? For the lion to lay down with the lamb means that the lion has to divest him or herself of its predatory nature. And the lamb must divest itself 
of its tendency to be a victim. That's when paradise happens. And I'm saying to you, my beloved, we are looking for a day when all the children are safe because all the children are our children, where we seek to find connections, not disconnections, where we blur our boundaries enough to recompose our decomposing churches and fellowships. Perhaps this is the vision of Martin Luther King's beloved community. And I see a group of brothers, Joseph's brothers, who were mad because he was a dreamer. But let me be a dreamer just for a minute and say to you that there's coming a day when all of God's children, black and white, rich and poor, straight and gay, in this country, a part of this empire and not. Those who vote one way and those who vote another. Those who believe in our understandings of God and those who believe in there's coming a day when all of us are going to understand and embrace the common love of God. Someone said that Jesus is coming and when he comes, boy is he pissed <laughs> and he is gonna straighten this whole thing out. But you know I'm coming to believe that the only way this kingdom will come is that you and I must bring it in the ways in which we love one another. I pray, and I pray with all my heart, that we will choose the both and God and demonstrate that reality in the earth until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. God bless you. It's my prayer.
Please be seated if you like. If you want to stand, we serve a both and God. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Would you please join me on page seven of your worship guide as we present our tithes and our offerings, our gifts unto God. We bring our offering not with thought of reward, but because we are grateful, O God. We give not from guilt over having so much, but because it is such a privilege and joy to share. We dedicate these gifts to enable a ministry that shares the good news of a God of radical inclusion. Empower us to give the service each moment requires, and even a deed as simple as giving a cup of cold water to quench another thirst. Amen. As the ushers come forward to receive your tithes and offerings, I ask you to be sure and pass the red registration pads. Let us know that you're here today. If you have specific prayer requests, you can put those on there. And let's continue to worship an amazing God as love goes on. Shooting star that tumbles down its flame cannot endure a scarlet rose with us brown to lose its fragrant loom. the night to vanish at the dawn oh but love yes that love goes on love goes on fortunes fail and disappear just like castles in the sand and power sports it causes fear but yields to stronger hands Fame for a moment but in a moment it is gone oh but love yes God's love goes on beauty fades and passion waits and faces show their years touch away but time heals the years tunes are soon forgotten and singers lose their song oh but love goes on a baby boy a starlit night and kings on bended knee healing hands bring inside and torture on 
on a tree a woman sings rejoicing he is risen he is gone his love yes love goes on yes that Love never fails, never gives up on you and me. Love goes on. Thank you, Jesus. This is the table of both and Everyone is really welcome here. That's, I know what Jesus intended when he took bread and said, one bread, one body. One cup of love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love that never ends. Whenever you eat and drink, Jesus said, remember that you are one body, one love. Let us pray. Almighty God, send the power of your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, and on these gifts of grape and grain. Make them be for us holy food that nurtures us in body and spirit, that by sharing this feast we may know the presence of the living Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.
wonderful God, God of all, all nations and all peoples, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Please be seated. Good morning. My name is John Rieger, and I'm one of the worship coordinators here at the church. I'm also a member of almost 10 years, and this will be the second offering. Uh, I want you to pay attention to your bulletin. You will find a document from the Finance Committee, an insert in there, which describes uh, information about the loan and things we're working on in the Finance Committee. So it's very important that you read that. And if you have any questions, uh, Bobby Springfield, our treasurer, and Dan Debris, our executive director, are here for questions in the back. So what I want to do is t tell a story about a friend of mine, a friend of mine that's going to have a birthday very soon. Um, this is a very good friend of mine. It's a friend of yours, a friend of our community, the city of Dallas, the state of Texas, a friend of the world. This friend has a global outreach and has positively impacted thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people locally and around the world. This is my best friend, one I cannot live without, one that I'll do anything for, whether it requires my time, my resources, my money. I'll do anything for this friend. This friend was born on July 30th, 1970. This friend had 12 parents. It was a group of 12 that caused the birth of my friend. My friend lived at 4612 Victor Street in Dallas. On December 17, 1972, my friend moved to a new home on 3834 Reagan Street. On October 4, 1976, my friend then moved to 2701 Reagan Street in Dallas, and at that time had 400 friends. This friend seems to move a lot. Then in November 1987, this friend moved to a pink building but was still not happy and decided to move one more time. So in 1992, my friend moved here, the Cathedral of Hope, 5910 Cedar Springs Road. My friend is the Cathedral of Hope, the largest LGBT and our allies church in the world, no, none larger. Coming up soon on July 27th, my friend COH will have its 44th birthday party. Is that not amazing news? So the question is, what do you get your best friend? We spend a lot of time, we fuss, no, uh, we fuss a lot over a present. We spare no expense when it comes to making an impression on a best friend at a birthday party. The time spent thinking about the person, the present, what will it be? How will it be wrapped? So what will it be? A church with over 40 ministries, spiritual clergy, the best music and choir, musicians, media folk, ushers, greeters, acolytes, lay ministers of worship, Bach volunteers, child care volunteers, food pantry volunteers, mostly all volunteer people that donate their time and effort, bringing their resources to make this church one of the best churches out there. A church living strong and turning 44 years old in two weeks. So what to give? I'm gonna give you an idea. What we would like you to do, every member of the church that attends on our special Sunday, and if you can't be there, please send it in, we would like each member to give $44.44 as a birthday gift to the church. Now, uh, some of you can do better than that, so we might look for a gift of $444.44. Then there could be that $4,444.44 gift, and then we also have the $44,444.44 gift, and for a couple of you out there, there is the $444,444.44 gift, so please prayerfully consider that. Remember that every gift counts, and if you can't give $44.44, give what you can, because even if it's $4.44, every gift helps. One more thing we ask, that you place your gift in a birthday card, and we have birthday cards in the Sources of Hope over here for sale. Um, and in that birthday card, when you place your gift in that and bring it two weeks from now on Sunday, that you write in that card what the Cathedral of Hope means to you. How has it affected or changed your life, or perhaps the life of someone else? What does COH mean to you? On Anniversary Sunday, July 27, two Sundays from now, please bring your birthday card and birthday gift, as I discussed earlier, and once we collect all these cards and gifts, we will take the cards and work them into a, a collage fashion, um, I guess, uh, display for everyone to read, okay? So 
Put your thoughts, what does this church mean to you in that card along with your birthday gift? I hope you're as excited as I am about our birthday in two weeks. Thank you. Well, happy birthday almost. <laughs> Dawned on me that your friend and I are celebrating our birthday on almost the same day. Uh, my mama was in labor on the 27th. I was born on the 29th. And so was she, by the way. We were born on the same day, 22 years apart. So happy birthday. I will never forget the birthday of Cathedral of Hope. And I have a gift for you for our friend, this great ministry that I've known for quite some time. And I'm going to sing a song. It'll be a, an opportunity to share that as you move into your what's next. God gives more grace as your burden grows greater and God sends more strength as your labors increase and to add it affliction God adds mercy and to multiplied trial God adds multiplied peace. And when you have exhausted your own store of endurance, have you ever felt like your strength was about to fail? And your task is just begun. And when you have depleted your heart of its resources, that's when God's full giving is only begun for God's love has no limit and God's grace has no measure and God's power has no boundaries no unto man for out of out of God's infinite God has riches God's riches in Jesus my God giveth and then keeps on giving my God giveth and then keeps on giving, my God giveth. And then keeps on giving, my God giveth. And then God giveth up again.
to friends. Uh, please stay for coffee hour and for refreshments. I want to encourage you to uh, leave the sanctuary part quickly so that the one o'clock service can get set up and be thoughtful as you're leaving, uh, walking through to the glass doors that, that the one o'clock service is going on uh, to be thoughtful about that. And uh, come back on Wednesday at seven o'clock, 7.15 for Pulse. Beloved, receive the promise of Jesus. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Peace not as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. May the blessing of the Holy One, Goddess, God, Eternal Spirit, remain with us now and forevermore. Amen.